All right, we're back. Wrestling Perspective, Lars Dennis. We're here with Sammy Callahan, who, by the way, was one of the first people in the wrestling industry outside of PD that was super nice to me. So I will always uh, be indebted to you of your kind. Ain't going to be nice. Quit the ass kick and let's get to it. I'm happy to see Lars. Not so happy to see Dennis. See, you got the nice Sammy a couple of years ago. Now I'm pissed off. I'm getting older. I'm bitter. I don't give a damn about you, Dennis, but I'm happy to be back on the wrestling perspective, especially to see my boy Lars. Yeah, so fuck you, Dennis. Yeah, fuck you, Dennis. <laughs> I'm just going to sip my coffee and let you two uh, have giggles together. No. Um, listen, well, welcome back. Fuck you. We're good. Um, let me start off with saying uh, I was at your match with Kenny Omega sitting ringside. It was a phenomenal match. And we always seem to ask Impact Talent about the the relationship that was the impact AEW and how impact seemed to have the shorter end of the stick. And to me, you are a impact gatekeeper. You are the leader, the guy who's been around the company, probably the longest at this point. That's a contracted wrestler. Not the longest, one of the longest. I think the longest at this point is Eddie Edwards and Alicia. It probably goes Eddie Edwards, Alicia Moose than me at this point. I think on the, on the active roster currently. But you're close. You're close. You got to get your facts straight, Dennis. I'm not just going to let you be out here just spewing nonsense. If you're going to say facts, you got to say them right. All right. Either way, uh, that relationship seemed very one-sided. You, We were talking off the air, and Lars and myself, we both agree that you don't get the credit you deserve a lot on um, what you've done in the industry, what matches you've been a part of, people you've put over, and people who put you over, and you've made them look good in that uh, aspect. From from that point of view, how do you see your career from, let's say, the last three years out? Where where do you view you as in a leader or top of a card kind of guy? Look, I think it's one of those things. I wouldn't say completely always oh, one side. It was really cool to happen. How many times in the wrestling universe or the entire timeline of professional wrestling do we have major companies working together? Anytime that can happen, I am all for it. I think it's cool. Getting a chance to wrestle Kenny Omega, I was getting a chance to go toe to toe. It's one of those things with me personally in the past three years, I have been one of the gatekeepers for Impact Wrestling, but I had one thing that, that made me hit that brick wall and that's breaking my damn leg. Uh, people seem to not realize I, I kind of get some hatred online. Like, Oh, Callahan put on some weight Callahan this. Yeah. I broke my damn leg. I came back early because I wanted to be here for impact wrestling. I wanted to be back here for the fans to be able to do what I love. I don't think people really realize how bad my leg break was. I broke my tibia and fibia. I straight Sid vicious Ooh. myself. Uh-huh. I broke my tibia and fibia. It wasn't a crack. They were broken and on top of each other. I also shattered my ankle into six pieces. I came back and I don't think I've been back now for a year for, since injury, but I don't think people really realize that it took me almost a year just being back in the ring to somewhat get back to my old self and, Finally, probably the last month, month and a half, I feel like I'm finally feeling to the point with my leg that I'm like, okay, like this feels good now. I'm not as worried about it. It's one of those things subconsciously going out in the ring, just taking one step, like running, jumping, like anything like that was something I had to get over, get over, get over, get over. I I like to think that I'm a confident guy, but something like that, like take some time. Like this is an injury that some wrestlers may never have came back from. And I came back, I'm still able to do it at a high level, but now it's time for me to like, like if you look even in the past, like three months, I've lost weight and gotten better shape. And it's only going to continue to trend that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've noticed and that we always talk about also about impact wrestling is the, the ability to tell a story and not only a story that, you know, you know, for a couple of months, but sometimes even longer stories. And that that's something that you're involved with, you know, with Violent by Design and how that story has sort of started and where it is now. And um, do you think it's a fair assessment to say that Impact uh, does it a little bit more of an old school way as far as the storytelling goes, is that they keep, there's always something to unfold and how they all make sense? 
hundred percent. I think Impact's one of the companies that is way better at being a company to actually finish storylines. If storyline happens, it's not gonna be like, oh, this isn't working, let's just drop it and maybe no one will remember. Like, even if it's not gonna work, Impact's gonna see it through to the end and try to make it work. I think that's something that we've done with the design angle. Like, I think when we first started doing it, people was like, oh. But Sammy's a baby face now. Why is Sammy joining the design? And they didn't quite understand it. And they were in the generation of instant gratification. And if things don't come right away, sometimes people lose interest in it. They're like, oh, this is wrong. They're using Sammy wrong. Or they're using this person wrong. But if they would have just waited and continued to watch the story and watch it unfold, like there was little Easter eggs in this entire storyline to show that I was actually trying to ruin them. I was actually just generating them into a point to get them where I wanted them. And then... The reaction we exactly wanted happened at Rebellion. The crowd exploded, and now everything is, like, kicked into second gear. Now, like, my promos are getting huge views for Impact Wrestling. Like, everything just took that time. And me, as a professional wrestler, I realized I've been at Impact Wrestling for a while, and I think this is any company you're ever going to wrestle at. You can't be in the top storyline all the time. Like, it's going to rotate. It's going to be a continuous journey of like different stories you can tell but i prize myself at being a person you could put me anywhere on the card and i'm gonna make whatever angle work i'm gonna make whatever i got work and it's gonna be at least something on the card that people are gonna be like okay you know what that that's good storytelling how because listen i'm i'm a marvel guy and i'm conditioned to watch a marvel movie and look for easter eggs i think the I don't even want to say average wrestling fan i think most wrestling fans are not conditioned to look for easter eggs within the wrestling program, whether it's a wrestling match, a promo, the story, how do we change that perception? Because you don't, maybe AEW with the CM Punk thing coming back was the first time, at least I can remember in a long time of like visual Easter eggs teasing us. And then with the violent by design storyline, how, how do we do that? I think it's one of the things people just need to pay attention and watch stuff. So many people are so quick to just watch one clip of a match. And I get it. I'm the same way. It's very rare that I'm going to watch any TV show while it's airing. Like I can DVR something or I can watch something online with zero commercials and just skip to the parts I want to see. But by doing that, we do miss big parts of stories. Like if people were to watch the design angle for the past five months, every time that I ruined them or screwed them over, I'd get in front of the camera and weak in front of the camera. And some people picked up on that. And people were like, okay, I see where this is going. Like, I'm invested in this. Some people might not have caught that. And that's no one's problem because people are going to consume their media differently. But in the world of professional wrestling, I think, hell, not even just professional wrestling. I think in the world in general, I think we all need to open up our attention span sometimes and not be that TikTok generation where we get instant serotonin from five second clips. Like, oh, don't like this. Oh, I like this. Don't like this. When, if we had actually watched a full clip, maybe we would have liked something we wouldn't have liked before. It's, it, you know, I started thinking about how Cody Diener and how where he started substitute teacher. Now he's a wrestler, you know, basically full time and just how he's been elevated. And it's always seems to me that like when you want to elevate a guy or you want to, um, um, I don't know, you want to have a really good match or you're always involved. Do you feel like it's because of what you were able to do as far as the Indies, different promotions, getting that experience? Um, do you feel like that plays a big part in why they can put you in any situation and you just thrive or, or like, you know, I know that you make other guys, you know, credible and, and, and bigger. I think it's one of those things is body of work and adding stuff to your resume. A lot of young wrestlers are like, oh, why ain't I looked in this certain light? Or why ain't I gotten this? It's because you don't have the body of work. You don't have any proof in the pudding. You don't have anything that people have seen that's on paper that's like, okay, this works. But if you look at my career from the indies to NXT to Lucha Underground, to Impact Wrestling, like, I continuously built that body of work of being successful, making something work, successful, making something work, successful, making something work. That's something that don't come overnight. That's something that you get by earning it. And like, that's like any field, like, hell, if you work at McDonald's and you're shitty on the grill, like they're not going to give you a better position. They're not going to trust you with more responsibilities, but it was like, Oh, that dude's really good at the grill. Let's uh, move him to French fries. Oh, he's really good on French fries. So now not only is he good at French fries, he's also good at burgers. So let's give him some more responsibility. It's the same thing with professional wrestling. The more things you do properly or the more you take any tiny uh, 
opportunity and make it work, the more you're going to get in the long run. Well, I want to piggyback that question because I feel like a lot of the guys, because you're able to do the death match, real violent matches, but then you can do a, you know, a fucking wrestling match, tell the story in the ring. Now, a lot of guys, when they get into the death match kind of wrestling or in that realm, um, which I know that you've done over the course of your career, they sort of get pigeonholed into that, right? You've been able to break out of that. Now, do you think that's an unfair stigma for certain guys who, um, like maybe yourself, maybe you were, you know, maybe there was a moment where you were pigeonholed that that's what you do or that's who you are or whatever it is. Um, do you feel like that's an unfair stigma on deathmatch wrestlers? I think it is and it isn't. I know a lot of deathmatch wrestlers that are amazing technical wrestlers too, but have gotten stuck in that. But they got stuck in that because that's what they allowed themselves to get stuck in. Uh, one thing like me and Moxley like really did when we were younger, it's like, we didn't do death matches for that long. We did death matches for like eight months. Like we probably did in a handful of time when we were younger, like eight to 10 death matches. And then we like use that reputation. Like we both did it to be like, like me in particular, it's like, I am a, a five foot eight kid. Like I, I wanted to have a reputation of like, Oh, this dude's crazy. So it's that much easier. A regular wrestling match. He was like, Oh, well, he, he cut a man with a pair of scissors. Like, I don't even know what he'll do with his bare fists. Like, but, I got out of that. Like I see so many deathmatch wrestlers now in particularly like, Oh, like they're in their late to mid to late thirties. They never got on television and they're stuck doing death matches each and every week. And like, sure, you can make a name doing death matches. And sure. You can make money, but the, you, you can't do that forever. Your body's going to give out. Like I very str strategically, like I didn't start doing death matches. I started as a classically trained wrestler and then I did death matches to get that reputation. Then I eased back and showed people like, Oh, yo, he's a really good testicle wrestler. But now I have it in my bag of tricks in my career that any, I'd be like, Oh, well, Sammy Callahan, will hey, do Sammy, just Sammy, so pull that I, out. Sam, Sammy, I just want to let you know that you just said I'm a very good testicle wrestler. Well, that too. Yeah, that too. I'm from Ohio. We got a different, a whole different jargon over here. I mess up words I, all the time. I, 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 I stand just, by what I said. I am a I, very good testicle wrestler. I, hope I don't regret anything I, like, I said. I hope like that, the dirt sheets read an article that says Sammy Callahan. Sammy Callahan, good, good <laughs> testicle wrestler. Well, you know what? In, in a testicle wrestling match, I would hate to see one of these appear. Sammy, this is from your not so distant past. This is a pizza cutter. That's the good one. That's the nice one. That's like a high brand pizza cutter. Yeah, and as you can see, there's still blood on this. Whose blood? I'm not too sure. That one's Kenny Omega's blood. That's, that's that right. one's from that's me right. and Kenny Omega because I remember right. signing that one and sending it to you. That's right. So I just want to let I just want to let everybody know that if there is a testicle wrestling match, Sammy Callahan's your man, and uh, beware, he might bring a pizza cutter. Go ahead, Dennis. You might. Have, oh, it's the Lorraine Bobbitt fucking death match well i remember the lorraine bobbitt story i don't think a lot of people do if you haven't look it up it's wild like i'm a big true crime person but i remember this unfolding when i was a kid and my parents watching this i remember every small minute detail and it was like the oj simpson case almost like everyone watched it it's like the current what everyone did with amber heard and johnny depp it was the same thing with that trial yep. Yep. i'm gonna get this back on track like me a good trial <laughs> i'm not gonna lie you got my my taste, I like me a good trial. Yeah, I am yeah. a trial person. <laughs> All right, from testicles to Lorraine to Baba, back to Impact Wrestling. The one thing Impact Wrestling gets right. This is a good episode, bro. This is a I good mean, this episode. Is, this is money. This is the money shot, Dennis. Oh, excuse me. Anyway. You said it, not me this time. I'm just trying to keep my composure here from you two. Uh, somebody has to be the uh, strict guy to keep this train on its tracks. But uh, the one thing Impact Wrestling does right is take wrestlers and turn them into producers. And I seem to ask you this every year we have you on, although it's been a couple of years now with PD going to WWE, being a producer there, Chris Saban, wrestling and producing and thriving. What about you? Is this in your future as you get older? You said it at the beginning of the show. You're you're getting older now. You can't keep this up. What What are your plans for the future in the wrestling to either stick around or disappear? I think I easily still got a good 10 years in me. So I don't think it's that far from the future, but Six. I've made a point since day one of the wrestling business. I've been in the wrestling business since I was 15 years old. I ran shows when I was 17, 18 years old and run shows now. Like I made a point to learn every job in professional wrestling from promoter to graphic design, to video editing, to live broadcasting, to agenting, to writing, to like pretty much to 
advertising a show to pretty much any job professional wrestling i feel like i can do because i love professional wrestling i always want to work in professional wrestling so i feel like no matter what i end up doing in my career i feel like i can always be plugged in somewhere and have a job and make money with professional wrestling I'm not just a wrestler. And I feel like too many people get tied in and put all the eggs in the basket. Of like, I'm just a really good professional wrestler. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are really good professional wrestlers. At some point your body gives out. What are you going to do after that? Like, I don't want to be one of those guys that have to go change my career when I'm 40, 50 years old. Like I always want to work in this field. And I, I very strategically my entire life from middle school on, learned and taught myself that will help me continuously have a job in professional wrestling. I was going to say, don't fuck up because you may be a host on this podcast. This is where people's career go to die. How are you saying that about Lars? You say that about you, Dennis. You can't say that about Lars. <laughs> I mean, that's fucked up, Dennis. I know. I Listen, mean, I, I, what, I, what point in everybody's life is being a host on this podcast? You no, know, at least we have normal backgrounds. We don't look like a ghost <laughs> popping in and out of shot with your little green screen effect. A ghost you're He's a ghost got- dennis how do you like that yeah how do you like that dennis jesus yeah. so i'm gonna have to get the fucking show back on track i want to talk about the ladies division and in, in impact and um i think it's the best women's division in professional wrestling i agree historically uh when you watch impact wrestling the women always are strong and i feel like um is that is that I mean not to 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 uh, to steal a phrase, but is that by design in that in the company? Do you is that something that they put a lot of importance on? I think it's one of the, those things with equity. Like Impact Wrestling isn't just a clout chasing organization that might do things to try to appeal to a certain demographic. Impact Wrestling, it doesn't matter if you're a woman, a man, if you identify as something else, it doesn't matter your your sex, your religion, your race. It, none of that matters. As long as you're good at professional wrestling, that's all that matters. That's how professional wrestling should be. Yeah. Like if you're good, you get booked. It doesn't matter what your political beliefs is. It doesn't matter what you adhere to. Like if you're good at professional wrestling, you're good. I think impact wrestling has done a great job of cultivating a locker room that we all believe that like we all get along. We don't care who anyone is or what they believe in. As long as you go there, do your job, be a good person. That's all that matters. And I think that's why the women's division does extremely well because well, the knockouts division, because they've always been given that opportunity because they don't just book someone. That's a pretty face. Sure. We have a lot of beautiful knockouts, but at the same point, I would put any of our knockouts in the ring with any guy in the business business and have the main event anywhere in the world like you look at rebellion a couple weeks ago and diana perrazzo and jordan grace had main evented the show oh. over everyone and it was absolutely amazing it wasn't just like oh that was that was good for a women's match no that was a good professional wrestling match and i think that's what professional wrestling needs to be and impact wrestling does that better than anyone well the reason why i mentioned that is because Rhea and charlotte at wrestlemania for me as a fan that was probably one of the greatest women's matches i've ever seen but then like literally not a short time later we got diana perrazzo and jordan grace and it's like well wait a second maybe that wasn't one of the greatest maybe that's you you understand what i'm saying it's like i i really felt like watching that match i was watching something like you said completely special it it trans it 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 just it was just, I don't know, it was unbelievable. So I, I, I'm i sorry. And I think it's one of those things that's changed professional wrestling. It used to be in the 90s and early 2000s. They just looked for a good-looking model that didn't give a damn yeah. about professional wrestling to play a role. Now all these, these women and all these professional wrestlers, they want to be professional wrestlers. And that's why they're good. That's why they actually stick to it. That's why you see these these women having amazing careers and doing amazing things because they actually want to be professional wrestlers. It's like taking professional athletes. I'm not saying all professional athletes don't translate into professional wrestling. Like some people, this is a backup and you can tell their heart's not in it. But some, like you look at a guy like Moose, as much as I hate him and want to just punch him in the head every time I look him in the face. Uh, he's a guy that before he even got in NFL, he wanted to be a professional wrestler. And his mom's like, yo, please go to college. Please do this for your career. So he did that. He was really good at what he did. So then once he was able to end with the NFL, he's like, you know what? I'm going to follow my dreams of being a professional wrestler. And that's why he's successful. And I feel like anyone that is an athlete that transfers to professional wrestling, that's the only way you're going to be successful is if you absolutely want it. Because this job's hard. Professional wrestling is the greatest thing in the world, but it's also the worst thing in the world. Like I, my body is destroyed. Like everyone's body is destroyed, but we do it for the love of the game. 
You know, speaking of wrestling and being hard, uh, I went to a I, probably now 2019, 18, a uh, Wrestle Revolver show, and I absolutely loved it. I need to make it back down to Dayton and see another one. But you've got a school down there. You're pretty plugged into the independent scene. Uh, for, I guess, maybe the major wrestling fans, do you, you're you pretty plugged in on who the next generation of guys coming up are. I mean, Trey Miguel, guys like that came up because of you. Who are the next generation of, I don't want to say the Trey Miguels, but those next guys that are coming up in the wrestling industry that we should keep an eye out on? I don't think they came up just because of me. I think those guys like listen to you the right the people. I, I was happy to be a part of that for guys like the Rascals, Ace Austin, Rich Swan, like all these different people. Like I, right now, if I'm saying like who I think is going to be the next big breakout wrestlers, uh, yo, like one person that I think is has the, the sky's the limit, uh, just got signed to Impact Wrestling. One gut check is Jason Hodge. Like Jason Hodge is a guy that was trained by Trey Miguel and Trey Miguel. There we go. And look at him. The dude is, I want to say 22, 23 years old. He's a stud. I think he's going to be absolutely a star. Or if you look at something like uh, my company, The Wrestling Revolver, there's two guys that are I've kind of taken under my wing and Crash Jackson and Damian Chambers. I think those are two guys you're going to be seeing in the next couple years. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it's weird when wrestlers from other promotions, uh, like let's say the top four, and we'll call the top four WWE, AEW, Impact, and uh, NWA, just for shits and giggles. Do you think it's weird when uh, somebody from one of those companies tr tweets something positive about another company? I'm not a fan of it because I am one of those people like I, I don't think everything needs to be broadcasted online. If I have a friend in another company, like I'm going to tweet them, I'm going to text them or call them. And like no one needs to know my relationships or my my friends or anything about my personal life. And I feel like too many people put shit online just to get their points of, oh, I know this person, or, oh, this is going to generate buzz, or they tweet stuff just to get the retweets, where at the end of the day, retweets ain't money. Retweets and Twitter isn't real life and real relationships. Like, that's why if anything like that I have, like, I'm going to contact them personally because that's what a real friend does. And that's just my opinion. Well, I mean, and, and today's, uh, sorry, Dennis, I'm sorry. No. I didn't see my finger. That's our cue. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that, that's okay. Um, well, because one of the things I was thinking about is that the way that the modern world is, and everybody's very thirsty for likes and for and for retweets and all these other things, you know, it almost takes uh, the uh, does it take does it take the suspension of disbelief away from what professional wrestlers are trying to do. 100%. And that's like my biggest gripe of it. Sure, I understand we're in 2023. Kayfabe ain't what it used to be. Like, the cat's out of the bag. But at the same point, like, I kind of miss the tribalism of, I work for this company. This company's the best. Screw all the other companies. Like, I, that's that's how I feel, feel like it should be because that, that generates the most, like, when you get a, an entire roster behind the product, that's when the show's better than it'll ever be. If all the Impact talent was like, yo, Impact's the best Screw everyone else. I don't even care about anything else in wrestling. And then all the AEW people did the same thing. Then all the the WWE and all the NWA people did the same thing. But it's one of those things. We let the cat out of the bag so freaking much that we do not seem larger than life to anyone. And I understand we're real people. And I understand that, like, the business is changed. But, like, I still want to have somewhat of mystique about what Sammy Callahan is and who Sammy Callahan is. That's why you look at my social media. You'll never see me talking about anything political, anything religion, anything that is outside the realm of professional wrestling. Because my social media is for my business. My my social media is for Sammy Callahan, the wrestler. What I do behind closed doors in my real life, I don't I don't want the world to know that because I do like privacy, and I think that's why so many wrestling fans are so inherent that they know wrestlers and are friends. They think they're friends with wrestlers, and they think they can do whatever they want because we've let them into our life that much. Well, that's, and that's like, nothing against like, fans. Like the fans are, they're great. They're the reason we're able to do the things that we're able to do. But at the same point, when you have fans showing up at airports with a hundred things to sign, like that, that that's, that's wild to me. Well, I mean, do you think that you keeping your privacy, you know, intact in, in setting those boundaries has held you back from being a bigger star? Not that you're not, but a bigger star. 
No, I think if anything, it's helped me. Like if you look at one of the biggest claims of notoriety I have in my career was me and Eddie Edwards baseball bat incident. The reason we, we didn't go online and be like, oh, this was an accident or all oh, this and that or this and that and this and that. We, we, we played into that. Because like at the end of the day, people still do want to be entertained. Still, people still want to have their uh, to spend their disbelief. And if you look at movies, like too many people, like I don't understand why people watch movies or people watch professional wrestling as a fan and want to jot down notes about like, oh, I give this match two point seven stars. Oh, this match could have used a little bit more of this. Or oh, I wish this match would have had this. Like, what happened to just enjoying it? And like, yay, my guy won. Boom, my guy lost. Like I, as a person, just couldn't imagine putting that much effort into like not liking something that I love. Like I'm going to try to like stuff I even don't like because like I am that type of person. I will watch a shitty movie that everyone else is like, oh, this movie was terrible. Everyone, don't watch this movie. Then I watch it. I was like, yo, I actually kind of like that movie. I don't let other people's like likes or dislikes change how I'm going to feel about something. And I think that's a, a huge problem with society right now. I think that's even a huge problem with some professional wrestlers with social media. We're, we're all going to look at the negative more than the positive. We might have 150 people go, that match was awesome. And like in your mind, you're like, that match was awesome. I love that match. But then we have two people say, oh, I didn't like that match. And then you let that ruin your day. Like you let someone else's opinion change your feelings on your art form. And that's, that's not how I want to live life. No, amen to that. Uh, well, and that makes me think about, you know, wrestling, the news, how much it gets out there that is just like fucking insane. Or it could be wrestlers feeding the dirt sheets certain things for angles and they don't even know that the fucking. So let me ask you this and just be truthful and honest with me. Do you consider dirt sheets, wrestling news, do you consider that legitimate journalism? I feel like it has to be at this point. How is it any more non-legitimate journalism than someone writing about the movie? Like, I feel like it is. But me as a wrestling fan, I never would have wanted to know the surprises. I never would have wanted to know what's happening backstage. Now, more too many people believe more in someone getting an argument backstage than they do in a storyline that's actually happening in front of them. Like, as a fan, I want to be surprised. Like, do you remember, forget that feeling, like watching the Attitude Era in the 90s or watching the Monday Night Wars and not knowing what was going to happen. Now, everything's out on the dirt sheets an hour before. This person's backstage. This is going to happen. There was talks about doing this match at the pay-per-view. Like, I don't want to know. Like, I never wanted to know. But that's just me. I'm also a person, like, I don't like spoilers with movies. I don't like... Like, no, let me be surprised. I want that surprise. Like that, that's that, that raw physical emotion you get from being surprised that we don't get anymore because we just read spoilers and we read everything else now. You know, it, it seems like when it's done right, and it hasn't been often where something comes out on a dirt sheet and then a company runs with it and creates an angle, it, it seems to work. Why? Because let's be honest, as smart as the fans think they are, and I think I'm one of those guys sometimes, we're all dumb when the thing comes out and you start seeing it play out on TV. Why do we not see that more throughout different companies where they take advantage of uh, the the fans that think they're plugged in and know everything that's going on and take advantage of that and create like a new type of kayfabe out of it. Because as loud as they might be, and I, I see companies trying that, as loud as they might be, that's not the majority of professional wrestling fans. As much as we want it to be. I always use this analogy. If you watch Raw or Impact Wrestling or AEW on Twitter, everyone's like, Twitter's the world. Twitter is the everyone's opinion. So Raw, just using this as an example, guess what? Let's say it gets watched 3 million, 3 million people watching on Monday. But on Twitter, the term hashtag raw or raw was mentioned 20,000 times. Like that really puts things into grand perspective. So the people that are watching it, that's what 10% actually tweeted about it. So that's 10% of the fan base. We let dictate the entire world. And that's the same thing with music, movies, anything else. People might, complain about how this person playing this role as an actor on social media. Oh, we got, we got a million people to sign this petition that we don't want this actor in this movie. Cause it's he, this person is not right for the part, but then it still makes 
a billion dollars at the box office. We put too much emphasis on what, like, sure, we should listen to social media at some point, but we just always have to keep it into perspective that that is a small percentage of the world. Not everyone has Twitter. Not everyone uses Twitter. Like we do because we're professional wrestlers and a lot of other people do. But in the grand scheme of things, maybe 10% of the world actually has Twitter. Do you think that because the world is in a, a place where we're advancing so quickly has, you know, do you, and I feel like 10, 15 years ago, wrestling just kind of had caught up to like, not, I wouldn't say pop culture, um, but it sort of caught up, you know, in, in a sense, um, it didn't feel like so behind. Do you feel like now wrestling tries to get to the future before it should, meaning that, the way things are presented to us are so quick and so, like you said, given away um, that there's really no time to actually, you know, involve our imagination and or and or our emotional connection to the person, the wrestler, the character, whatever it is. I think one thing is like professional wrestling in particular, we're usually on the pulse of what's going to become relevant. Like professional wrestlers was using Twitter before Twitter really blew up and became a thing. Professional wrestlers was using MySpace to advertise himself before MySpace blew up like that. Professional wrestlers L was using TikToks. Like all we're great at figuring out what the next trend is going to be. But it's one of those things we we have to understand that there's a world online and there's a real world. Like online as much as we might think it is, is not the real world. Like there's an entire, I could never log onto Twitter ever again. I could disappear from wrestling and go live in an entire new community and n not know anything that happened about professional wrestling ever again. I would never even hear about it. I would never even hear about movies or anything. It all determines like what you want to do in life. Like life, life is that weird around the, the world. We allow the internet to be like the internet is everything but it's really not there are so many people in the world that may not even have the internet like which is crazy to think that don't have the internet or people that aren't logged in every minute every day posting everything they're doing and they're still living their life and having happy lives because what happens in the real world is also real just because i didn't tweet about eating an apple on twitter doesn't mean i still didn't eat the apple if that makes sense I want to go back and talk about this injury you had. And I know that you're smart enough to put yourself in a position where you won't hurt yourself again. Or if you're not ready to be at a main event level, you won't try to jump up into the main event level without exposing that you're not 100%. So right now, today, where are you at as in health? Are you 100%? Are you 75%? And how hard, two-parter, two how hard is it to, to not be part of that main event picture while you're still trying to get healthy? Oh, I can be plugged into the main event anywhere right now in any wrestling company around the world. Like, I don't have any gruff on that. As far as, like, physically, my leg, I'm, I think I'm about, like, 90%. Like, I think when I came back, I was probably at 60, and it took me a year of being in the ring and traveling again to get it back to where it's going to be. Like, that's something I have to realize. My, my leg will never feel 100% ever again. But 90% is pretty damn good. Like, I'm still going to be able to do the things I used to. My big thing right now is, like, I finally got the leg where I wanted to, and now I'm really starting to concentrate on my body. Like, when I was injured, I gained, like, 50 pounds. Like, I wasn't able to, like, that's another thing people don't realize. When I was injured, I wasn't even able to do cardio for almost four months. Like I wasn't able to do anything because I had holding pins in my leg. So I couldn't stress my body at all. So I sat on my couch, depressed as hell for four months straight, not doing shit. There'd be three weeks at a time. I wouldn't even leave my house. Like going from that to getting back like on the swing of things, it was something when I started leaving the house again and started traveling again, like that messed with my psyche completely. Like I had anxiety about just going outside, like it wasn't like an anxiety I could control. It was like, wow, this is different. Like I'm going back out into the world. I'm not held up in my bubble anymore. Well, you know, I, I need to take this opportunity to put you over um, in a major way because, you know, I, so this is a two part question. I feel like you're, you're one of the most humble guys I've ever come across, especially in the professional wrestling business where it's pretty much, you know, counterintuitive to bring humility to the table. Right. Um, because I feel like you need a certain amount of ego, a certain amount of narcissism to be successful. I think about the history that you've had, the experience that you've had, and I'm pretty sure, and I'm, maybe I'm guessing, maybe you can correct me, 
But I feel like a lot of the, the big high profile matches that you've had in your career, you've had a majority of what a, 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 a majority of say of what's been done in them, because it feels like a Sammy Callahan style of match. And I'm talking about like, you know, with fucking Omega, uh, the list can go on and on and on and on. So how much of that am I on and how much of that am I correct? How much of that credit? Because it doesn't seem like you get the credit that you deserve in a lot of ways uh, for your matches. It seems like the more high profile guy seems to walk away with the, the kudos. So it's one of those things. And this is something we have talked about before. Look, I've been extremely blessed to wrestle some of the best wrestlers all time like wrestle some of the best wrestlers currently on the planet my match with kenny omega my match with pentagon like both matches that won match of the year for different companies and everything else my match with some other people like it was one of those things like i i don't think some fans and people really realize like they always i i've seen this in my career a lot it's been since day one a match will get super high regards that i'm in but it'll always be the other person that gets the credit like Oh, like Kenny Omega, look what he did with Sam McCallahan. Oh, Pentagon, look what he did with Sam McCallahan. Oh, Tessa Blanchard, look what he did with Sam McCallahan. Like, how, why is it never, look what Sam McCallahan did with these people? Because there's one common denominator in all these matches and all these like things that really pop off. And it's usually me. Like, and I don't like being that person. It's like, oh, I'm this good. I'm that good. But at the same point, like, if you look at my track record in professional wrestling, Anytime I wrestle someone of that stout and a match gets that kind of like, oh my gosh, like it is a Sammy Callahan style match. Cause I, I, I really do coin myself as being the most versatile wrestler on the planet, any style, any opponent, I can do it and bring the best out in people. And like, that's just some performance. Some wrestlers are going to be people who's like, yo, like this person brings the best out of this person. This person brings out this person. And like, that's been my career. That's been my forte since day one. I feel. Lars, did you have a follow-up? You had your finger up. No, I was going to pick my nose, and then I got oh. distracted. Well, <laughs> uh, I know we're wrapping this up, and my final question, kind of along those lines, and I'm kind of shocked we haven't brought this up earlier, but is your ability to change your persona with still being Sammy Callahan, where you don't get that kind of credit, where like every time Chris Jericho tweets it a little bit, everybody's like, he's the smartest man in the business. Like He's just wearing a tie, guys. What What's going on? But you keep changing little bits of you, which uh, if you're smart and you watch wrestling, you go, holy shit, that's that's fucking genius. But once again, you don't get that credit of being very smart on how to change without changing who the core Sammy Callahan person is and call them back to different personas. Is, is that something that maybe because once again, I like to think I kind of know you a little bit on a friendly basis. Is is that something that bugs you where you don't like? Come on, guys. Did you not catch that? That's fucking genius. Uh, it's it's kind of funny because I do have moments like that. I remember like I like to coin this moment, like we're compared to this moment. So Rob Zombie put out the Monsters movie and it was super campy, super cheesy and everything the Monsters was from the, the original release of the 50s and 60s. And I saw people being like, oh, this movie would have been like really great if I think if I thought that Rob Zombie tried to make it like this i think he just accidentally made it like this so it's a sucky movie it's like he did he made it he made it like that like for a reason like but people still don't want to give people the credit for something they created like obviously he made it cheesy and campy for a reason like you don't just get to say like oh i don't think he meant to do that so i'm not gonna give him the credit nah fuck you like he did that for a reason. That's the same thing in professional wrestling. And I use a guy like Chris Jericho as a blueprint. Like, I always tell young wrestlers, like, look at Chris Jericho's career. Every couple of years, he's done something to reinvent himself and become relevant. And I, I follow that my entire wrestling career. And I've gotten to the point, look, I have a lot of people that love me. And when they, the people that love me, love me. And I have a lot of people that hate me and will always hate me. But they're always talking about me. I'm never a guy that just disappears and no one hears about. Like, I'm always a guy... No matter where I was, if I'm on television, if I wasn't on television, I'm always somebody that the wrestling world is talking about. And that's called being a professional wrestling, being successful at what you do. Have you actually ever had a conversation with Jericho about this? 100%. I did this podcast a couple years ago, and I've, I've said that exact thing. Like, that, I based everything on And I've seen many podcasts before. Like, I, he is, without a doubt, one of the greatest of all time. 
Like the dude still does it at a high level, and the dude has always reinvented himself while still continuously being Chris Jericho. And that's the art of professional wrestling. Agreed. I mean, I don't really think that I have a follow up question. I think that was the perfect ending. All right. Well, listen, uh, Sammy, Wrestle Revolver, that's a huge thing. I, I want to come out and see another show. So, uh, you and Lars both got to come out to the show. You guys got to come out to one of the Iowa shows, dude, because they're crazy. We draw like 1,500 people in Iowa. Wow. There's lasers, there's smoke. We have the best wrestlers from the like, we're a rare breed where we can book people from Impact Wrestling, AEW, Ring of Honor, like all the major companies. I can get everyone under one roof and we have a great time. I'm yeah, only an hour sure. away from Dayton. Mm, Dayton ones are fun, but I'm telling you, you got to make the trip to Iowa. It's worth the it's worth the hundred fifty dollar flight. I'm telling you, Dennis, it's worth it. Okay, okay. Lars, let's let's go. I, I, I've always wanted to go back to Iowa. Said no one ever. <laughs> Yo, I I love Iowa. I'm not even gonna lie. I've been going to Iowa since I was 14 years old because I have family out there. If I didn't live in Ohio, I'd probably live in Iowa. I like Iowa. Des Moines is pretty cool, man. I'm not no, going to lie. No, listen, Des Moines is a very cool city. I've been there a few times. The I nightlife's do, great. The club's great. The, I, the I atmosphere's always, great. I always, I always, I always I end up there in the summertime for whatever reason. And I always feel like it, you kind of look forward to that because, and the days that I've been there in the midst of summer have always been these nicer days. And it's like it's just the wide the wide open space. I don't know. It's 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 definitely a fucking very cool. And the city is one of those places. It's still a big city, but it's not like New York where you can't. It takes you an hour and a half to drive yeah, yeah. five minutes. Like yeah, yeah. you can get around Des Moines pretty easily. In the city, like there's so many good things to do in Des Moines. Oh my! I run some pretty badass wrestling shows in Des Moines. Who would have thought? Well, I, I I would much rather come to Des Moines than New York City. So there you go. Open invitation anytime you want to come out. All right. Well, Wrestle Revolver, go check them out. Impact Wrestling, of course. Go watch Impact Wrestling. YouTube them. Every place you get your wrestling media, that's where Impact. We're on Access TV every Thursday, 8 p.m. You can watch us on Impact, Impact Ultimate Insiders on YouTube. It's like $1.99 a month. If you have internet, you got Impact. No yeah. excuse. And Sammy, are you still doing Twitch? Ah, no, I didn't like it. All right. No, don't, then don't. I go tried on. it. I like to play video games for myself. I don't want to talk to people. It's too much. <laughs> it's too much. Go. Well, listen, uh, we'll say our goodbyes off the air, but Sammy Callahan, thank you so much. Go Google him, follow him on social media if you want to get whatever he's doing wrestling wise. Sammy, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Testicles for sure.